Jesus is the paradigm. He came down as a servant and made himself of no reputation and served. And so, for me, living in North Minneapolis, this is where Jesus would live. Because this is where the masses huddle, right? This is where the diversity is. This community needs me. That's why I'm here. This community needs me. So I'm needed. Isn't that great? <laughs> So let me tell you a few of the things, the incredible things that have happened. We've moved into North Minneapolis. We didn't know the community. And so to be willing to live in that state of novelty, of unfamiliarity, of ignorance, is the first requirement for transforming the world. So we've lived in North Minneapolis for 22 years. The reason for the creation of inner city blight and distressed communities is not so much the presence of bad people or the presence of poor people or the presence of disconnected people. It's the flight of people who are connected, the flight of people who make a certain amount of money. Uh, and the absence of that leadership and the absence of that capacity has created a void here that has remained unfilled for generations since fair housing laws and integration came. But the real problem is a spiritual problem, that human beings are prejudiced and don't want to live next to each other. That's the problem. And that's why we moved here. We said, we're not going to join that. We're not going to join that. So we're trying to lead by the example and say, you can survive it. I'm 71, and I've lived in inner city since I left college. That was a pledge I took. Haven't been shot yet. Haven't been shot at yet. And I raised two children. We've lived here for 23 years in this community. It can be survived. Power to Power the, to the pa 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 parents. Hi, this is Sandra and Don. How are you? What we do today impacts who our children become tomorrow and um, honored to be part of this partnership. Um, but most importantly, I am mother to um, four children. I have a bonus son, Andre, and then Zaina, Asante, and Amani. And um, that is the most important job that I have. And, um, and then this, my co-host um, partners with me in that. Yep, that's right. This is Don Samuels, and I'm CEO of Microgrants. And, uh, been a father uh, kind of like two rounds because I have a 42 year old son and then I have a that's my bonus son yeah 19 year old <laughs> daughter so uh, I got a lot of experience folks and um, as as we've talked about it's all about getting better right it's not uh, trying to shame anybody and so that doesn't matter where you are whether you're in the suburbs or in town um, or in the inner city that you are getting the information that is going to uh, enhance the quality of your children's lives and your life. Okay, we got another caller. I am a devotee, I guess you could call me, of Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest who has heads up the Center for Action and Contemplation. And he teaches contemplation, meditation, and he also inspires or uh, encourages people to get, get active in their community and their world. I'm glad I discovered meditation. You, you just be with God rather than asking God for stuff. Meditation, the purpose of the meditation is to lead you into spiritual space where you can become a more effective actor. And if we are meditating, have a, a real contemplative life, and we start to move through the world respectfully, and we start treating people with deference and love, forgiveness, and uh, Everybody's lovable. And the world is worth saving and treating good and, and not destroying. So bringing the meditation exercise into the inner city crisis, for me, was bringing it home. If, if, it, if it can work for real, it'll work here. If it can't work here, it can't work for me. Because this is how mine, 
This is the reality my neighbors live in. But we moved in and we started to organize the block. There was gunshots every night. There were, the people were not connected with each other. It was the great American society that we all want, where we have diversity, people of all colors and cultures coming together and not understanding each other and not communicating with each other. So it's not just proximity. You're going to have to have relationship. So we started to try to do that. And out of that, we eventually became block club leaders and then neighborhood leaders and developed some capacity to deal with the drug dealing and the crime. And then my neighbors asked me to run for office. I became a city council member and did that for three terms, ran for mayor and lost. And yes, there is some loss in there. And, uh, and then ran for the school board. In the meantime, we had started to have vigils, going to the spot where someone was killed and staying there all day and fasting uh, the next day after the homicide. And so if there were 20 homicides in the North Side community, we had 20 vigils. It was a big challenge. We were overwhelmed with frustration at the death of George Floyd and of course with sadness at the subsequent looting and burning and all of that and wondered what to do. We know the city council was planning, the mayor was planning, and uh, we knew that business people were planning whether or not to come back, how to finance their return, etc. And we knew that cultural and social groups were planning uh, how to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. A lot of conversations, but we knew that there was no coordinated or centralized conversation uh, on the spiritual aspect of the problem. And so the idea kind of grew from that, and it specifically being a place-based thing, grew out of seeing so much illegal activity on West Broadway, especially, where people were actually having sales, flea markets for the looted stuff, and were advertising it on social media. You come to Merwin's Liquor at Broadway and Bryant, and you can buy Target goods, or goods from AutoZone, or wherever it was looted. And this was on social media, it was sold openly. Police wasn't stopping it. They were so overwhelmed with other things. And so we wanted to create a different use of space on West Broadway uh, to sanctify, create a sanctified space on West Broadway where good things were happening, where people were coming together uh, and uniting for a, a good cause, for a positive and community building cause in the guidance of the spirit. Because people come together across different faiths to solve the political problem, the social and financial problem. But when it comes to the faith community, we all go off and do our own thing. Many people are overwhelmed and we don't know if everybody is on the same accord. So we wanted to create a space where everybody of every faith could come, people of no faith who were just wanted to be in solidarity with, you know, grieving the situation or dreaming about the future could come. Nine people would pray at a time, with socially distanced, maybe 10 feet, eight, nine, 10 feet apart, and uh, that they would pray for eight minutes and 46 seconds which is the time it took George Floyd to die. Anybody could pray in any way they wanted. And each day of the 30 days was led by an African-American congregation. And so it was an African-American led uh, project. We felt it was important given that it happened to George Floyd and that um, the community needed to take some leadership in the process of healing and not be healed at. <laughs> But, but to bring people along for the healing process. That's why you saw in the tent, that, that was largely inspired by the meditation process. So it was a meditation. No denomination meditates uh, differently than the other. It's silence, right? So that was inspired by Richard's work and, and his theology of uh, meditation and action. I grew up in Jamaica. My dad was a Pentecostal preacher. We were a poor family. Pentecostals are all about going to heaven, right? Primarily. So a lot of the songs are about going to heaven, the sermons, and worldliness is a bad thing. And so there's a kind of removal from the, the carnal things, including government. And then there's a lot of classism. In Jamaica, British system, classist, racist too. And I didn't hear any peep from the church about any of that. And I saw it every day because I went to a middle class school, lived in a poor neighborhood. 
So every day I'm going back and forth and seeing the dynamics of this inequity. So at some point I had this shocking realization that I had two lives. I had a social life and a spiritual life. I really hadn't really integrated my spiritual life and my social concerns. I talked about it all the time. I read about it all the time. I never prayed about it once. I never prayed about that stuff. So I decided to do to start. And then I realized that I, I was forgetting to do it. So I, I decided I'm going to create a discipline around it. I decided to fast every Wednesday. And that would help me to remember to pray about the social thing. And so I did that for six years. And it changed, it changed me. It integrated me. And so um, it helps me to, that integration has helped me to live here, for it to understand it as a spiritual thing I'm doing. And I'm not just an activist, you know, down with the man, down with the pigs, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an activist. I'm a child of God living in community. I like to lead by example, so I, I try to lead by inspiring people, by telling them how possible and exciting things are and the world that we can create or where we're trying to go, and being interested in the people themselves rather than just the goal, because actually the goal is the people. I'm CEO of Microgrants. And Microgrants is a small nonprofit that makes grants uh, uh, to low-income folks who are starting a career or a business. And they come up against some obstacle uh, that can be solved with uh, 1000 to $2,500. It was started by an uh, ex-priest named Joe Salvaggio, who was an activist priest in the 60s. He resigned the priesthood and continued to be an activist. He, he met a lot of people who were kind of stymied by lack of a few dollars to get a certification or a uniform or to take a course. And he said, if I can raise some money to help people, whenever I meet those kind of people, I will help them. So he did. And we uh, work with 50 partner agencies that train people. And when they're ready to launch, we provide them with this grant. And so we have a lot of success stories of people who are making, you know, $500,000. There's another program called Lights On. We put vouchers in every police car in about 75% of the state of Minnesota, sheriffs, police, and the state troopers. When you get pulled over for a broken light, instead of a ticket or a lecture or a bullet, you get a voucher to get it fixed for free at a local uh, service station. So Lights On, we started when Philando Castile was killed. He was pulled over on the premise of a broken light. And we knew that some of our grantees from microgrants get used cars because we help people to buy cars and that their lights are going to go out more frequently than the rest of the population. So we're, we, we felt very, very uh, deeply about Philando's death and we wanted to do something. And out of many conversations, we evolved this concept of giving vouchers to police officers. So when they pull someone over, instead of a confrontation, it's a conversation and solving the problem. People get stopped, four tail lights out, headlights out, and believe me, police officers don't want to stop good people that are just trying to raise a family. Um, and when we find an opportunity there to help them avoid being stopped by the police and help them, you know, keep the food on the table for their children, this is one of those things that we think is a great benefit. Instead of exacerbating the problem, giving them a ticket, they can't afford it, they get pulled over again, they get their car towed, they can't go to work, they lose a job. And that's not just a theoretical thing, this happens. We know this happens from many stories, testimonies at the state from people who are asking for the laws to change around this and telling those sad stories. So we're making a big difference. We've given out uh, 2,500 vouchers so far, and it's changed a lot of relationships. We have a different kind of relationship with the police.
We're trying to bring our resource friends and relationships into relationship with the North Side. And at the same time, we're trying to bring the North Side community, especially those who are folks who are disadvantaged, into relationship with the mainstream, uh, with opportunities and so on. When you do that, um, it's a very strange place to be. And that's a form of leadership. Well, one of the things that I learned in, in all of, uh, in order to do these difficult things, is to be willing to not know, to have what we call a don't know mind. How can we learn to be learners rather than learn to be experts? Because once you become an expert, you stop learning. And once you stop learning, you're now, you're now potentially insufferable, right? You're not humble, you know it all, and you don't listen to anybody because you know it already. And so listening to my wife and hearing her talk about her viewpoints and trying to learn from her how to see the world in a different way, it turns me into a different kind of person. I'm listening. There's so much richness in yeah. the black community. Thank you so much. Power to Power the, to the parents. parents. We're out. <laughs> you have to be willing to not know. And it is that realization very early that freed me up of the fears, of the uncertainty, of the intimidation, uh, of uh, the ignorance, uh, of uh, of the mistakes, to be willing to not know. I, it is a gift to be able to really embrace that state. Because At the end of the day, we know so little of reality. Uh, so a posture of a learner is always relevant. The Lutheran a theology of grace is a hugely impactful on me. Grace is a winsome and winning strategy. It, it transforms people. But I, I still have some of that, you know, miracle thing in me from the Pentecostal days, you know. I feel that I'm not discouraged by, by overwhelming odds. I feel that that is how God has always operated. And that's why the Bible is so appealing, because it's a story of people tackling overwhelming odds one after the other, after the other, after the other. That is my theology of change. Entering into the unchangeable with high expectations and giving God a chance to do his thing.